disappointment, Susan. I know you just stated that I love Bob's teaching. And I'm going, me too. <laughs> It's okay. It's all right. So, as I was getting ready this morning, which was a nightmare, um, I said, God, I don't think I'm ready for this. And he said, you're not. <laughs> and I went, oh, thanks for the encouragement. He said, what I want you to do is take the end of what you've put down and start there. Interesting, huh? So, this is what I'm going to share with you. It's my journey, and it's my journey with the Holy Spirit. And it's been an up and down road. The last thing I wrote down was Psalm 19. He rescued me because he delighted in me. He rescues all of us because we're delighted. He, we delight him. I mean, think about that. The God of gods, we, we put a smile on his face. He goes, ah, when he sees us coming towards him. Wow. So, this last page is signs and wonders are a part of the gospel. But we often just kind of negate it and just go, well, that's for the church down the street. There's too much trouble in signs and wonders. There's too much accountability for it. But there isn't. All we need to do, this is just one thing we need to do in order to start enacting those signs and wonders, just one thing God says for today is our lights on the lamppost. We need to be seen. We need to be seen so the signs and wonders can be expressed. When I thought about it, I thought, that's really easy. <laughs> but we make it really, really hard. We do. And I saw that with the vision that God gave me for this body last May, that if that's what we need to do, what do we need to do to get ready to hang our lamps? What is it that's holding us back from showing our lights. Is it a lack of faith? I don't think so. I think it's just that we haven't figured out that we're partakers. We're co-laborers. We're those people that are walking hand in hand with Jesus. We're do gonna do the work. We're gonna do it for the city of Tacoma. Did you know that the city of Tacoma is called the city of destiny? That that was given to them many, many years ago when there was a huge influx of boats coming into the harbor. And then there was something that took place politically and through the unions that all of those contracts went to Seattle. And this was in the 20s. And it was right after that that the mayor at that time, which I don't know who that was, claimed that this was the city of destiny. So now, if you'll go to the courthouse or if you'll read any documents through the city, not the county, just through the city, it will say up above on the letterhead, city of destiny. And that's where God has placed us in the city of destiny. Now, I think that that's awesome. I think that that's really, wow. And I'm thinking all this time that with this vision that I had, I, I, 
kept it to myself for a really long time because I didn't want people to think I was delusional. <laughs> and that's what happens when God uses you to speak his word sometimes. You think, oh, surely he wouldn't have told me that. Who am I? Well, it doesn't matter who I am. What matters is that the information get out there. I'm willing. <laughs> I have nothing to lose, absolutely nothing. So what I recognized during that time of the vision that he gave me, I saw a map of the city and the Pierce County area. And in this map, there were seven areas that were very dark and misty. And it was very obvious when I was looking down on this map which areas were dark and misty. And I went, oh, Lord, do we have to go fight now? Do we have to waste a whole bunch of time, you know, doing the thing that you do when you come against the enemy? And he goes, <laughs> no, no, all you need to do is hang your lamps. He said, I don't want you fighting. That's not your fight. That's mine. Ah, don't waste your time fighting. You just need to get in there and let the light shine. That's all. So those four areas in the city of Tacoma were Hilltop, Ruston, the East Side, and the Tacoma Mall. So over the last couple of months, I've been visiting all of those places. I just wanted to validate that this was true. And you know, each place I've had an encounter with someone who has come up to me. I did not go to them. And this one lady in the east side, I stopped there for a cup of coffee. And she was sitting on the sidewalk, the curb, and she was kind of mumbling to herself. And she was, um, I don't know how to express what she looked like. She had tracks of tears, which was a lot of mascara down her cheeks. And um, so it was obvious that she had been crying. But people were just walking by her. Maybe they knew her and had seen her there for a long time and just kind of ignored her after a while. I don't know. And I couldn't ignore her. And she finally looked up. I just stood there. I still didn't get the coffee. I stood there and she said, come here. And I did. <laughs> I listened to her. Oh, okay. Um, and so I just stood there, and she's still sitting on the curb, and she said, come down here with me. And uh, so I did. What am I, a puppet? <laughs> you know, who is this lady? And she looked at me, and she said, I need you. And I looked at her, and I thought, either she's high, or this is what God is answering my prayer. And so I chose to believe that it was God answering my prayer. And I said, you don't need me. You need Jesus. I've heard that before. And I said, well, hear it again. You'll hear it until you don't need to. You'll hear it. Just hear it for one minute and believe he loves you. Just hear it for one minute and have it bring hope to your heart. That's all, just one minute. Can you do that with me? I don't know, she said, I just, I just don't know. And I said, I do, I do. I know you can, it's true. Okay, okay. So there were similar things throughout those four areas that I went to that took place and Just recognizing that we don't have to fight the mist, that we don't have to be concerned about the dark areas yeah. in the county. Yeah. It just, wow. I went, I can do this. <laughs> he, 
get your lamps out and hang them on your lampstands. This church is going to impact these dark places. I don't know how, you guys. Notice I'm going backwards. Did I share with you that God said start at the back? Good. And believe it or not, this is all working. <laughs> so those torn and broken places serve a purpose for this lady that was, you know, torn and broken. And I, I didn't know what to say to her. I just, other than telling her for just one minute, believe that Jesus loves you. And just for one minute, believe there is hope for your life. And I thought about all those torn and broken places that we all go through. We all have those areas in our lives that we take with us and hide. And we all express maybe to Lord about those torn places inside of us, but we're not too quick to uh, let anybody else be involved with that. I know I wasn't. And there's a reason for that. When you come from a place of shame, there's an unwillingness to show yourself because of the shame that colors everything. And you have to take a step of faith and believe that what you think and what you sense, it isn't God. It's the shame that covers you. So once you take that step out, it's broken off by nothing that you've done other than just stepping out. And I just started praying in tongues. And when I first got saved, I had three little words of my tongue. Yada, 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 yada. I thought for a while I was having an experience of spe speaking the last four stanzas of the um, most popular tune for that time. <laughs> because I didn't know and have enough information about what speaking in tongues were all about. I had no information. I just had this secret place with Jesus. And I knew that I had this secret place. And it started with yada, 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 yada. <laughs> and I went like that for a good couple of years. And that satisfied me because it brought me into the presence of God. And now you have to realize this is a little Catholic girl that's coming out of a very Catholic, Roman Catholic background and has been raised with Jesus on the cross her whole life. And it wasn't until I walked into another type of church other than the Catholic church that there was a cross hanging up there that didn't have Jesus hanging on it. First time I'd ever seen that in a huge display. And I just stopped. Uh, I, fortunately, we weren't in a service. I was going to go downstairs to be trained on how to use flannel boards for the kids in my neighborhood. <laughs> and um, and I, just, I just stopped in the sanctuary when I saw that cross, and I was overwhelmed. And this guy came up alongside of me, and he said, can I help you? And I said, so you took Jesus down. <laughs> yeah, we did that. <laughs> and I said, uh-huh, good. I said, you know, he's been on that cross way too long as far as I'm concerned. I don't know what the significance is. Now, okay, I'm saved. But I don't have any background in the Bible, 
except the Du Wave Bible. And that's the Bible that sat on the buffet in the dining room on a stand and nobody touched it because it was too expensive. <laughs> So, you know, the only Bible that I had were the sermons, the epistles from the priests on Sunday morning. That was it. And when I figured out that there needed to be some information out there that I needed to get, there were two stores in the Tacoma area. One was the Catholic store, and across the street was Deitman's bookstore. And I just booked over to Deitman's. And I kind of looked back over my shoulder to make sure that <laughs> the Catholic bookstore didn't see me walking in the public <laughs> bookstore. So I, I got a Bible. And the first book that I read in the Bible was Revelations. <laughs> yeah. That's called having no information. <laughs> but you know, I fell in love with John. I just thought he was great. And I thought, wow, he's either on some heavy stuff. Now you have to realize this was the late 60s, early 70s. Or this is a God thing. And I realized to reading it, and I have to explain to you that I did not get any of it. <laughs> there was no revelation for me personally other than I recognized this really impacted that man who wrote all this down, that he really was seeing all this, and that it must be God inspired because I found in the front of the Bible that this was God-inspired words. So I didn't think that they would put them in if God didn't inspire them. I trusted what the book said. So then because of that, I went to John. And I found reading John, the scripture, <laughs> John 3.16. And so God so loved the world, and I went, why do you love this world? What's it about? And so it was through reading the scriptures and the Acts and finding out about Paul and all these crazy peoples that God created to be his disciples. And I mean, good grief. Do you think he could have chosen any worse? I mean, we had a tax collector that wasn't really pretty, wasn't nice at all, you guys, not nice at all. And we had um, a bunch of fishermen that probably smelled really bad. And we had just a lot of personalities that were coming and going as they chose. And yet God drew them in and Jesus made them disciples. And I thought, you know, my first thought was, if he can do that for them, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm going to be okay. And, and I recognized that Jesus just had a lot of love. That he was the epitome of love. And when I recognized that, that changed my world. Because no one had ever loved me enough to die for me but him. Nobody. Nobody even came close to changing the life that I was brought into, not wanting it and yet being there. And he, he saved me. He saved me. He made me come to a recognition of the fullness of the Godhead. Well, then I found the Holy Spirit. And that, that word of three little words, it grew. It grew. And it grew to where now I can say I do have a prayer language. <laughs> so this book that I found 
about revelations, it was talking to seven churches. And I read about those seven churches. And I went, boy, they are in trouble. <laughs> I did figure that much out. <laughs> and the thing that impacted me the most, and will understand where I'm coming from, was that John fainted when he saw Jesus. Well, when I went back to John, and I saw the relationship between him and Jesus, John said, I'm his best friend. <laughs> you know, he is my friend, Jesus is my friend. I figured out, and I mean, journals, many, many journals. I read one the other day, 1972. And in it, it said, John loved Jesus because Jesus loved him first. <coughs> and he was his friend. But in Revelations, when he fainted, he saw the full majesty of Jesus. He saw God. And he didn't see God here on earth. He saw God in that vision. Think about that. I don't know if any of us recognize that we can be friends of Jesus, but to recognize him as our majesty and for him to serve us and he's our majesty. Wow. Yeah, so. In those three little words, I can't believe how easy this is going here backwards, but anyway, <laughs> in those three little words, ada yada, um, I recognized God very graciously showed me that I was saying, yes, Lord, yes. And I went, oh, that was so exciting. I was so excited about that, that I was saying, yes, Lord, yes until I figured out, no, Lord, no. <laughs> because all of a sudden I was getting information about these people that were standing next to me, raising their hands and worshiping. And I'm looking at them and I'm standing next to them and I'm going, oh, well, I don't think I can tell him that. He doesn't know me and I don't know him. It's, it'll be okay. And I said, well, it may be okay for you, but it's not okay for me. And he said, yes, Lord, yes. And I went, oh, yada, 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 yada. Oh, well, now I'm kind of stuck, don't you think? You know, I mean, okay, so, you know, Holy Spirit said, I've got your back, come on. And so I went to this person and I said, hi, I'm Evie. <laughs> now, you know, th this was not, fortunately, we were in a charismatic circle, but not everybody was understanding of the gifts and understanding of the gift of tongues and understanding of the prayer language. And so I went to this gentleman and I thought, well, I'll just give it to him. And the worst thing that can happen is they'll close the doors on me and I'll have to find another church. So I said to him what I was going to say that you know he was concerned about his um, middle child. And um, and I told him that the reason he, he was concerned about his middle child was because this middle child was so much like him. And that he was basically concerned about himself. And that that was okay. That God knew what the concerns were. And he was going to take care of them point by point. And to trust him. Just trust him. Well, he just kind of broke down and I kind of squeezed away from him and left. <laughs> Which Bob will verify I did a lot. 
And <clears throat> so one day after that, this guy came up to me and he said, I was concerned that my middle son would take on the depression that I've lived under my whole life. And I could see the writing on the wall. And I'm going to trust God. Would you pray for me? I'm just staring at him. I'm going, I don't know anything. I know nothing. You probably should have somebody else pray for you. But God said, yes, Lord, yes. And I went, oh, right. <laughs> OK. So I prayed for him, and he broke. And I prayed for the depression to leave him alone. I didn't know enough not to say it. And he got up the next week. And half of this church now is filled with the Holy Spirit. And the other half is fighting it. And he got up and expressed his thanks for Jesus taking that darkness away from him. Well, that started a whole bunch of stuff, which I won't get into. So Jesus wants his bride ready. And that's why we're going to put the lamps on the lampstand. There is no power from God that is separated from love. None. There's no signs and wonders. There's no gifting. Nothing but the love. And the hope of my call is to love. That's it. And in Peter, it says, says, we get to participate with the divine nature of Christ. Wow. I mean, if we didn't know better, we would think that we were creating demigods here. But that's not the case. And I've heard people express that concern. And that's not true. That's a lie. God created us to spend eternity with him. He wants us by his side. And he wants those that are being torn up and hurt and brutalized by this life to be set free. That's, that's what this is all about, guys. That's why I'm standing up here. Because my heart is for those that don't have a clue. But we've got the clue. <laughs> we, we do. We get it. And all we need to do is take it outside and let it shine. <clears throat> he healed me of my broken heart and made me whole. He set me free. And I had one huge broken heart. It was fractured, it was torn up. <laughs> and all this time, I'm trying to say, yes, Lord, yes. And I probably gave words to people that weren't all that loving because I didn't have that fullness of who Jesus was for me personally yet. I had a little bit, and it just gave me enough spice to <clears throat> step out and believe that the individual that was in need was more important than what I did or didn't have really didn't have a whole bunch to do with me. I figured that out really early. It was just me saying, yes, Lord, yes. And so I did. I said yes. And I ministered. I don't know if it was all that effective. <laughs> some got healed. Some got saved. Some were encouraged by the words. Some were set free, which was a big deal for me, because I like it when people get set free. So my healing brought me to the place I am now. God's great desire is to share his identity and his nature with us. So 
I have an urgency for this body, an urgency for us to be heart to heart with Jesus. I have an urgency for us to express that to the people outside of this house. I have an urgency for us to recognize that there's a work to do and not that we have to become involved in works, right. Right. but that the grace is significant enough that we can go out or we can bring them in. We can bring them in. I, I was at a stop sign on the way to church and this guy was doing a weed eater on his uh, little strip there by the, and I don't ever have my window open on that side, but I did. And he said, where are you going? And I looked at him and said, I'm going to church, you wanna come? I said, I'm gonna be preaching. You are? I said, yeah, you wanna come? The light was still red. He said, not this Sunday. I said, what does that mean? <laughs> he said, next Sunday? I says, where do you live? Right there. So if I come and I knock on your door, you're going to be ready. He said, I promise. Wow. And I went, so I'm going 4280, 4280. That's what it said. <laughs> because I don't want to forget. So his address is 4280. So those are the things that happen. That's kind of what happens. I just step out there and stuff happens. And it's fun. I'm having a good time. I'm not being bogged down by what other people think. I know some people think I'm a little delusional. But you know what, that's okay, because when they're having a tough time, guess who they call? <laughs> they're not embarrassed to come and tell me their woes because I'm out there. I let them know, listen, this is what I did. This is how I was. I was a one broken vessel. But Jesus restored me. He made me whole for this time, so you could hear what I have to say. Isn't that amazing? I would have never guessed that in a thousand years, which is by the way how much time we're gonna spend here with him. <laughs> we must have revelation to really know Jesus. We have to know the revelation of love for us to be spurred on to do what he has called us to do. There isn't one person in this place that doesn't have a specific call. Not one person. God is creating an army for the purpose of bringing together his bride. He is heart sick that there are those out there that he has designed for himself and they're not here yet. They're not here. They're unsaved, or they don't believe, or they've been caught in a lie, and, and they're heart sick. And it makes Jesus want to grow us up really fast so that he can redeem the ones that he's been called to redeem, so that he can bring them in, so that they'll be ready when it's time for the bridegroom to come back. I cannot set anyone held captive free. I want you to get that very clear. Neither can you. But if I am free in him, he can use me to set you free and to set them free. Not bad, huh? <laughs> Pretty fun, huh? I mean, there is just nothing more fun than watching people get set free. How am I on time? Is it? Hey, not bad. So, you're fine. God, this is, this is where I'm going to end it here. God talking to me keeps me connected to myself. 
and the world around me. I want to protect that relationship at all costs and to fulfill everything that needs to happen for Jesus to have his prepared bride. So because my relationship with Jesus is relational, my relationship with you is relational. See, I didn't always love the church because the church hurt me. But do you know when I came back this last time, I hold no angst or no bitterness towards the things that were done to me or said about me. It's like, get this, God took it off of me and set it over there. I did not have to process anything. <laughs> I did not have to make anything okay. It happened like that. And that's where we're at. That's how God's going to minister these days. It's not going to be time consuming for the healing to come and be made known. It doesn't have to take years and years of struggle to know that you've been set free. This time is a good time. It's a good time. And it, <laughs> get older, your friend. And it's a time that we're all supposed to be in. Did you know we were created for this time? That there's a reason we're here today, and there's a reason that you're all listening to me? Amazing, isn't it? I mean, think about it. But none of it would be without the love of Jesus. That's the starting point. That's the ending point. Oh.